I'm Richard Schweitzer, and I am a teacher and an interpreter of Norse culture with a Dark Ages recreation company. In a culture where pottery was relatively rare and metal was expensive, soapstone, or steatite, was a common material for Norse cookware. Soapstone was readily accessible, relatively easy to work with, cheap, durable, it retained the heat well, and it hardens when exposed to heat. There's a good reason that soapstone is used by cultures all around the world. In the Dark Ages Recreation Company, the workhorse of the cooking pots is a replica of an iron cauldron from Sweden. Weighing in at 13 and a half pounds, a pot such as this would have been a massive investment. In the Icelandic Gregas laws, an iron cauldron is priced the same as a mare, or three quarters of a cow. This would have been beyond the means of the average Norseman like we're portraying. Then in 2003, my wife and I were given a large piece of soapstone as a wedding present. An average pot in the Viking age is about 25 centimeters in diameter and weighs about 5 to 15 kilograms. My first pot came out at 9 kilograms and just over 18 centimeters. The shape was largely based on the wooden finds from Coppergate, but it is not dissimilar from other hemispherical soapstone pots. Although I had made wooden bowls and worked in soapstone for a decade doing pewter casting, the process of making the bowl taught me a lot about the stone and the tool marks. In particular, I found that the necessary path of the chisel to get the smooth curve on the inside of the bowl resulted in the same swirling tool marks found in a great many artifacts. This leads me to conclude that these grooves are from an unfinished stage in the manufacturing process, left for the buyer to complete, and not to increase surface area to speed up cooking, as some have suggested. In September 2007, the pot was christened with a root stew using a rough lid made from hand-split planks. The stew was placed in the corner of a fire pit to cook, and the pot was rotated periodically. The fire was used as a communal fire constructed for maximum light rather than a properly built cook fire. Nevertheless, the stone conducted the heat well and fairly evenly. The stew slowly built to a boil, after which it was relatively easy to keep the temperature constant, and it could be left unattended for long periods of time without concern, despite my initial fears of it cracking from the heat differentials. The radiant heat from the pot distributed the heat well. The conduction made moving it from the fire difficult, but the stew stayed hot for a very long time. In short, it did an excellent job as a slow cooker. As Olaus Magnus wrote in 1555, in southern Norway there are stone pots. If you take them boiling from the fire and put them on a stone slab or in cold ash, they keep their heat, so that for the one who happens to be present afterwards to notice this, it may look as if they were cooked without a hearth. While it does require turning so that it cooks evenly, it is easy to rotate. This has resulted in some very characteristic circular scarring. These round scratches are not something noted in artifact descriptions that I've found, but Crawford and Smith do describe a pot shirt from the Biggings in Shetland, which has been worn very thin on one side, possibly from being repeatedly dragged across the hearth stones in and out of the fire. This pot has made many stews and pottages, but it wasn't sufficient for meal preparation on its own. More cookware was needed. There are three main shapes of pots found in the Norse context, hemispherical, handled, often called ladles, and trough-shaped. There are also a few more unusual shapes, most notably rectangular pots that appear in Shetland, plus the flat bake stones. The task thus became to try and experiment with each of these forms and determine what they're good for. A good number of the hemispherical pots have iron handles riveted through the sides for suspension. However, I've never been brave enough to risk drilling through my own pot to add iron handles. My most recent trough-shaped pot, though, has small shelf handles onto the ends into which holes are drilled. Although this hasn't really been put to the test yet, having it suspended above the other pots in the latest cooking experiments has made its likely primary use clear. Boiling water. It will undoubtedly prove useful in making soups and stews and porridge, but the cooks are always needing hot water. As for the oblong shape, well, it is the perfect shape to hold a chicken. There are two handled soapstone pots within Dark. Neil Peterson commissioned one based on a Norwegian find from Lingdals, and I carved one based on one from Jarlshof in Shetland. There have been many of these found with bowls ranging in size from 10.5 to 30 centimeters in diameter. However, their form makes their function baffling. The handles on modern cookware are almost uniformly around 17 centimeters long. Anything longer and it gets awkward and increasingly heavy. Anything shorter than 10 centimeters and it doesn't fit many hands. However, the handles of the artifacts range from between 6 and 28 and a half centimeters in length. The longer handle could have been useful to place the bowl deeper into a larger fire, or possibly into an oven or kiln where there's a restricted opening. Graham Campbell in Viking Artifacts claims that this bowl was clearly used as a saucepan. 
It's unclear, though, what Beyond the Fire Blackening he bases this statement on. There have been residue samples studied, but I haven't seen any reports on this pot style with anything more specific than organic residue. Because of the appearance of soapstone is enhanced by oiling, turning it from a dull gray to dark and shiny, just having oils present, whether meat or dairy or vegetable, isn't really enough to indicate use. With a bowl of 13 centimeters, my Jarlshof ladle proved almost useless. The pot was too heavy, the handle was too stumpy, and while it worked okay for reducing berries into a sauce, the handle prevented the pot from being turned for even cooking. A reworking of the pot improved the weight and a rounder bottom made it easier to stir, but it is still too small for most things. The Lingdahl's repro reproduction was a better size, but it also demonstrated the problem with this design, by the handle breaking before it ever saw use. Eleanor Larson suggested that the Shetland ladle is of different shape because of the stone is a bit different type than the Precambrian bedrock of Scandinavia, which does not lend itself to round vessels. But flatter bottom could have been a design choice, so that it would be more stable on flat surfaces, just as the shorter handle could have once been longer and then rounded after it broke off. The long handle is impractical for storage. It would have required a rest to keep the pot from tipping over while cooking, and yet there are over 200 of these and been found in graves with twice as many found in male graves than women's. A longer two-handed handle would have been useful for controlled pouring. If these pots aren't specific to cooking context then, does this imply that they might have been used for melting pewter or pitch or fish glue or rendering fat for lamps? As the ladles have been found in marshes as well as in graves, some have identified them as religious objects, but that always seems an unsatisfactory answer. Our experiments showed that the handle becomes much too hot if exposed directly to the fire, so a focused fire would be needed, or else a barrier to block the heat from the handle. However, the regional Lingdahl's bowl seems to have soot on the handle. The soot on the bowl also seems rather streaky, which implies a smoky fire of softwoods rather than the smooth patina that you get from a clean burning hardwood. And this, in turn, implies outdoor use. As noted by the finds from the Iron Age village in Upukra, in Sweden, the bulk of the firewood there was coppiced ash and hazel, which would burn quickly and produce much less smoke than the same volume of wood in a large log. There also don't seem to be any voids in the soot to imply the bowl was resting on any supports. Without seeing the bottom, a grill could be possible, but the only grill that's ever been found in a Norse context was with Mastermere chest, and that one is much too light to support stoneware. The rectangular soapstone pots from Jarlshof were used between 1100 and 1300. The National Museum of Scotland database notes the bowls of this shape are a local development of the late North Shetland. Both bowls have a rectangular mouth and taper down to narrower base, and they nest together. There are a couple explanations for this difference in shape. Esther Renwick suggests that the shape is a result of the quarrying process. It is true that steatite is susceptible to fractures, but on the Shetland South Mainland by Cunningsburg, by the burn of Katpund, there is an area about 80 meters square of a quarry that was excavated. And it had sections that were quarried out wind blocks, but there's also evidence of circular pots and baking plates being produced there. It seems clearly that a variety of different products were being manufactured. The superior of Norwegian stone is claimed by several papers to explain the differences in the pot designs in the Shetlands. The square vessels may have been developed because of the fault lines in the stone or for easier shipping or storage, but it's more likely that the rectangular shape implies different usage. What that usage could be, however, is a bit of a mystery. Unlike the handled pot, full rotation is possible, but with a flat bottom, it requires a much more effort as the pot needs two well-protected hands to lift it out of the fire, rotate it, and then reinsert it. The flat bottom of the larger pot was somehow somewhat more useful for frying onions and root vegetables. However, the dimensions were a bit small and the corners were a problem when stirring. Now, re-examining the artifacts suggests that the reproduction is a little bit sharper than the original. The smaller of the Shetland pots was not used at all on its own. It was simply too small to be useful in cooking for a large crowd. However, it did have possible abilities when combined with a larger rectangular pot to form a Dutch oven or casserole. Experiments with baking both fish and bread this way were both quite successful. As Irene Bog notes, ovens existed in Denmark since the Roman period. And while ovens do not seem to have been a part of many Viking Age communities, there are written references to ovens in Norway that date from the 13th century. It isn't too unreasonable, then, to propose that the principles of baking might have been applied to baking in soapstone. And there's also some justification for this. 
In Wales, there's an old tradition of pot bread, where the bread is baked in an inverted pot placed on a stone slab. This brings us to one final soapstone product, the bake stone. Bake stones were flat stones, about one centimeter thick, generally circular or oval in shape, and approximately 20 to 5 to 50 centimeters in diameter. They generally had patterns of short lines or furrows carved in one side with the other side left plain. They first appeared in the 11th century in Norway and remained in large-scale production until the 17th century. It's been suggested that the baked stones were a Shetland innovation, but ceramic baked stones dating from the 10th century have been found in the Hebrides. In the Edic poem Rigzula, two types of bread are described. First, a loaf of bread, heavy and thick and swollen with husks, and later, loaves so thin and white from the wheat. Clearly, there are differences from the common flour from barley and oats, which lack gluten, meaning the dough would not rise, to the expensive and more versatile white wheat flour. Charred remains of the bread from the Viking Age have been found, particularly at Birka in Sweden. The bread remains have been analyzed, and the anal analyses show that there were several different types of bread. Placing a baked stone directly on the coals at the edge of the fire worked well for baking an experimental flat barley bread. There was some burning around the edges, but that could be remedied by making the loaf smaller so it wasn't so close to the edge, or moving the fire farther away from the bake stone so that only the coals underneath it provided the heat. At 20 centimeters in diameter, size of a small pizza, the bake stone was on the small size for the fines, but the perfect size for the pot lid, which some bake stones have been interpreted as. The result was a flatbread that was larger than it could have been possible with the iron frying pans which suggests, again, the possibility that there could have been a shift in production along with the change in cooking elements. Although, according to written sources in the later Middle Ages, bread was normally baked in the ashes in the northern Norway. This bake stone was easy to remove around the fire, but that would have not been true for the big 50 centimeters examples found. That size would have been heavy and awkward to move and would have dominated the space in the fire pit. Analyses of baked stones in the northern Norway did find residue of milk products and oil seeds, such as beans or peas, and that opens the possibility that the stones were being used for grilling other foods. However, another possibility is that the large stones were only used occasionally, like with the biennial baking days, which became a tradition in Sweden. Coincidentally, 50 centimeters is the size of the crisp bread that they make in the demonstrations at Skansen in the Open Year Museum in Sweden. Surprisingly, bake stones never became a trade item outside of Norway and the North Atlantic region. Again, this suggests the significant difference in food cultures. Additionally, the bake stones made in Shetland were rectangular. Could this be the result of the production of rectangular pots, or does this also indicate a difference in cooking practices? Clearly, the experiments so far have only scratched the surface. In addition to continuing to work with the pots already made, there are several avenues that come to mind as worth exploring. Ideally, more pots need to be made. Amanda Forster and Richard Jones actually list seven types of pots, including circular flat-based vessels, either with curved faceted sides or flared straight walls with suspension handles from Norway, and 30 centimeter square pots from Shetland. It would be good also to acquire some match pots in order to compare boiling times between the grooved and the smooth interiors. The various sizes and shapes of baked stones also need to be tried, particularly to find out how best to manage the largest of the baked stones and see how easy it is to keep them at baking temperatures. The groove patterns in the baked stones are also intriguing, and it would be interesting to experiment with a few variations to see what purpose they serve. Finally, three quarters of the soapstone finds from the Hebrides, particularly the largest and the smallest, do not show any evidence of use over a fire and were likely used as storage. This was probably fairly typical. This thus suggests a number of cold storage experiments that, to determine how well steatite vessels do with temperature and humidity control, and more generally, how well does food stay preserved in stone versus ceramic or wood containers. As Irene Baug remarks, food was not only food, and the tools used in food processing were not only tools, both the food and the tools used to symbolize social and cultural ties. Not only is the way to a person's heart through their stomach, but so too is it the way to their culture. By examining how they prepared the food they ate, we learn a lot about the resources and priorities of that culture, with the added advantage of taste tests along the way.